Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to call the Assembly Committee on Judiciary to order. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblywoman Krasner. Here. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblyman Miller. Here. Assemblywoman Wynn. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblyman Ortlicker. Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Here. Assemblyman Wheeler. Here. Chairman Yeager. Here. And Assemblywoman Gonzalez is with us as well. So we do have everybody present. That means we have a quorum. I um, want to thank all of you uh, for joining us this morning. Welcome to the members and members of the public who may be watching on the internet or on the YouTube channel. Welcome to day 39 of the 81st session. I hope everyone uh, was able to get to the building safely today. And perhaps the weather is a reminder that if you don't have an ice scraper, that is something you'll want to get for your vehicle because sometimes we get snow very late into the legislative session. Before we get started with today's agenda, just a few quick housekeeping rules. Members on the Zoom and guests on the Zoom, if you could please remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking, that'll help with the audio feedback. And then if you can remember to state your name each time you speak, particularly after you're asked a question, that'll help our committee secretary prepare the minutes of the meeting. We do expect courtesy and respect in our interactions with one another. We don't always agree on policy. That's totally fine, but we need to make sure we're being respectful to each other the legislative institution, and most importantly, our legislative staff. Finally, members are using multiple devices to access this meeting, laptops, desktops, extra monitors, iPads, iPhones. So please don't see it as a sign of disrespect if members appear to be looking away during the meeting. They're most likely just trying to access exhibits or notes on the bills. With that behind us, uh, members, there are two bills on the agenda. We are gonna take them in reverse order um, I'm going to be presenting the first bill that's going to be presented today. So I am now going to hand the virtual gavel over to Vice Chair Wynn to run the meeting on that bill, and then I'll be back after that. So Vice Chair, it is all you. Oh, I'm having some meat problems. Oh, wonderful. I'm back. Um, um, at this time, I will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 2. I'm sorry, was it 202? Yes. Yes, that's what I thought. Um, and I will turn it over to you, Chair Yeager, to begin when you are ready. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Wynn and members of the very hardworking Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Steve Yeager and I represent Assembly District 9 in Southwest Las Vegas. It's my pleasure this morning to present Assembly Bill 202. We have uh, Mr. Mike Morton from the Gaming Control Board with us on the Zoom. He is here to help answer any questions you might have on charitable gaming and the charitable lottery registration program. Thankfully, Assembly Bill 202 is not overly complicated. It simply caps the annual fees that a qualified organization must pay to conduct charitable gaming, caps those fees at $10 if the total value of the prizes offered by the organization in one calendar year does not exceed $100,000. So you will see that language on page three of the bill. Uh, that is essentially the only um, addition that we are making to the statute. And then the act would become effective upon passage and approval. The intent of this bill is to ensure that the qualified organization is able to keep more of the money it collects to fund its activities and also to cut some of the red tape associated with charitable gaming. Now for a very short history of how we got here, Assembly Bill 117 from the 2019 session, which was an Assembly Judiciary Committee bill, made some changes to our charitable gaming statute. One of those changes was to remove 
the charitable gaming fee structure that was in statute and allow the gaming control board to enact regulations setting the fee structure. The gaming control board did just that in revising and adopting regulation 4A in October 2019, essentially enacting a fee of $25 for each event or day that an event was offered or for each tournament conducted. Although under that regulation, the chair of the gaming control board has discretion to waive all or part of that fee. And the chair did in fact do so on several occasions since the regulation was adopted. Um, I began to hear from some smaller charitable organizations that the fee structure adopted resulted in higher fees than they had previously had to pay or that they had to spend more work putting fee waiver requests in to the gaming control board. Uh, then COVID hit and most of these charitable events uh, simply didn't happen any longer. So I took that time to think a little bit more about the legislation we had passed in 2019 and I thought it made sense statutorily to limit those fees for smaller organizations so they don't have to go through the fee waiver request process and they can keep more of the funds. It also saves the gaming control board some time in having to review and approve fee waivers. So that is simply what Assembly Bill 202 does. And uh, Madam Vice Chair, I would be happy to answer any questions. And as I noted, Mr. Morton could answer questions if folks have questions about how this really works uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the real world. So thank you so much, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. No problem. I appreciate you bringing this legislation. This is actually one of those things that um, come up all the time in questions that I have from like church organizations and other small nonprofits about lotteries and raffles. And I believe we have a couple of questions and I will start with Assemblyman Wheeler. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, Chairman Yeager, as I read this, I see it, this just apparently um, uh, pertains to charitable organizations. Is that something that like only a uh, 501c3, that type of thing? Thank you, Assemblyman. Steve Yeager, for the record. I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Morton to answer that, but I did want to note just for the committee that in the actual digest of the bill, so on the front page of the bill, they do provide the definition of qualified organization in the digest as an alumni, charitable, civic, educational, fraternal, patriotic, religious, or veterans organization, or a state or local bar association that does not operate for profit. But I'd like Mr. Morton to perhaps talk about the kind of organizations that they actually see conducting these events. Good morning, members of the committee. Mike Morton with the Gaming Control Board for the record. Uh, Assemblyman Yeager is correct. A uh, qualified organization um, is defined in NRS 462.125. Um, and uh, Assemblyman Wheeler, yes, a qualified organization does have to um, be a um, company that operates not, not for profit. So they have to provide us with um, their nonprofit letter or their 501c3 status. I'm either on the federal or state level. Hey, thank you. That's uh, what I thought. Uh, and I did read the digest, but uh, I was actually setting you up. Just <laughs> because what I'm what I'm not seeing here is uh, different types of organizations like women's clubs, organizations as um, you know, that have been organized as PACs, uh, things like that, um, political clubs. Uh, so well, I guess this bill doesn't cover it. We're in luck because I have a bill coming up that will. So thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Wheeler. Appreciate that. Um, I have another question from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I was just curious, um, you're changing it not to exceed $10 for um, more than 100,000. Um, it's kind of a two-part question. It go, does it go back then to the regular fee structure when it goes above that amount? And then how would, um, and I'm just going to use a personal example, um, a couple weeks ago, I know the Speedway had a 50-50 raffle and it was as, as more people joined in, it became bigger and bigger and bigger. How would that fee structure work out? Um, I think it ended at, you know, 160,000, but when it began, when one of those 50 50 it started i think sixty thousand. so kind of a two-part or 
I'll pass to Mr. Morton if he doesn't mind. Not at all. Mike Morton with the Gaming Control Board for the record. Um, Assemblywoman Bill Boy Axelrod, as to your first question, yes. So uh, obviously the Gaming Control Board and the Gaming Commission will have to amend our regulations um, if this bill were to uh, become law. And once the the plan is once the hundred thousand dollar threshold is reached on annual prize value, it would revert to the existing fee structure, um, including the existing fee waiver um, provisions that are currently in regulation 4A of the Nevada Gaming Commission regulations. Uh, as the second part of your question, um, because the the Chapter 462 of NRS does give wide regulatory authority to the board and to the commission for events like that that um, they apply to become a qualified or they apply to register as a qualified organization, but they might not be quite sure what that prize limit is. Um, we work with them to, you know, pay what they'd have to pay no matter what up front. And if the prize value reaches the, the requisite amount more than that, um, it happens um, or for events that host those 50-50 raffles or for example, 51-49 raffles, um, at Vegas Golden Knights games, um, they sort of have a historical perspective on how much money they will raise. Um, and uh, we have that historical perspective too if they've applied uh, to be a qualified organization before. Thank you for that, Mr. Martin. Um, do you have any follow up, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod? Um, I think um, I, I have a question here. I see it in the chat. Um, what, what do other states do that don't have gaming control boards in this area? Mike Morton with the Gaming Control Board for the record. The best example is actually something that Nevada doesn't have and it's you know a state lottery. Um, so a lot of states um, that have uh, state lottery commissions uh, or departments of lotteries are they run um, their regulatory authority over um, charitable raffles um, or charitable lotteries through their um, state lottery organizations. Thank you, that makes sense. Um, I do have one other question. This is probably for Chair Yeager. Um, in bringing together this bill, um, what organizations, I know that in 2019, obviously the Golden Knights were pretty heavily involved in that legislation that led to this. Were there other organizations throughout the state that also took an interest in clarifying some of this language? Thank you, Steve Yeager from Assembly District 9 for the record. So you make a good point, which, you know, one of the reasons we enacted some of the changes in 2019 was as a result of uh, professional sports teams that arrived, particularly in Southern Nevada, the Vegas Golden Knights and the Raiders who were doing charitable uh, gaming on a scale we hadn't seen before. So we, we put some of those provisions in. And I think that was really the folk, one of the focuses of the bill. And then after session and after the regulation, was enacted in October, um, I began to get um, some communications from some smaller charitable organizations. And, and to be honest, most of them were up here in Northern Nevada. And I know Assemblyman Wheeler got some of those communications, Senator Settlemeyer, uh, I think Assemblywoman Krasner. So there were just, you know, some organizations here that were operating on a pretty small scale and they were a little bit confused about why we changed the rules on them. And so, you know, I think in consultation with some of my legislative colleagues, uh, including Assemblywoman Carlton, who, who also heard some issues from smaller groups, um, I took some time to think about it and thought that this was uh, perhaps the right way to go. So we still maintain that the bigger players in the space are going to have to pay more fees. Uh, organizations like the Golden Knights that, you know, routinely generate over $100,000 in their 50, 40, 51, 49 raffles will pay a little bit more, but we wanted to make sure the smaller organizations such as, you know, veterans groups that do bingos or there were raffle events at um, some of the civic groups, particularly up here in Northern Nevada, that we thought this was a, a good way to, to protect them and make sure that more of the funds can stay with the group and they can continue to do some of the really great work in their community. So, you know, I just wanted to thank uh, my legislative colleagues who sort of heard the call for change here and reached out and so hopefully everyone will, will be able to support this concept and I think it strikes the right balance. Thank you for that. And I'm kind of looking around here. Do we have any other further questions or comments? Oh, I 
I see Assemblywoman Krasner. We'll go ahead and call her. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Wynn, uh, from you to Chair Yeager. Uh, actually, it's to Mr. Morton. Uh, so, Mr. Morton, I just want to clarify because I'm one of the people uh, that Chair Yeager mentioned that have received several phone calls and emails and complaints. Uh, smaller groups like a women's club. Uh, once once a month, they do a 50-50 raffle where they might make $100 or they might um, have a little auction for a, a vase of flowers that's probably worth $20. What is, how do I respond to them now with this bill? What, please tell me what I should say to them. They're going to only pay $10 for the year, but they still have to file with the gaming control board or or what is my correct response for those groups? Or are those groups even covered? I think you said they were, but if you could please clarify on the record. Sure, Mike Morton with the Gaming Control Board for the record. Assemblywoman Krasner. So if they are, uh, so in order to hold a charitable lottery or a charitable game event, um, statute now and has always said that you must be a qualified organization and a qualified organization um, is is a entity that operates not for profit for a charitable purpose so um, the, f the first hurdle is being a 501c3 and so um, if we're talking about an organization that is a 501c3 uh, they would have to file um, an application with the gaming control board and so if this bill were to become law they would file uh, an application with the gaming control board you know, provide all of their contact information, um, the, the type of charitable lottery or charitable game that they are going to hold, um, just confirm the prize value with us and they would have a $10 fee uh, for the entire year if this bill were to become law. Um, I am happy to, after this meeting is over, um, send you the link to the application so that you can share it with your uh, constituents or whoever is asking you. Um, the application might change a little if this bill were to pass, but the location of the application and the link will stay the same. So I'm happy to share that information with you. Go ahead and follow up, Assemblywoman President. Uh, thank you very much. What if they're not a 501c3? What if they're just a small organization? Could be some kids in the neighborhood or could be a women's club. What if, I mean, are they going to be, you know, violating the law if they have a, a, a raffle? Play bingo. Mike Morton with the Gaming Control Board for the record. Um, under um, existing state statute, and if this bill were to pass, charitable lotteries and charitable games cannot be conducted unless um, you are a, a 501c3 organization. Wow. Okay. I see Assemblyman Oren Licker. Has Thank a you, as well. Vice Chair and uh, David Orant Licker for the Record Assembly District 20. Um, for Chair Yeager and, and Commissioner uh, Chair Morton, I support the idea of limiting how much these smaller organizations pay. Uh, I'm a little nervous about putting statutory amounts because that just means in a few years when they become outdated, we'll have to amend this. Uh, so I'm curious why the, the commission and the board weren't more responsive to these concerns because they obviously have authority to change the regulations and why the regulatory process didn't work to get us to the right point. Mike Morton with the Gaming Control Board for the record. So back in 2019 after um, Assembly Bill 117 passed um, in we started the regulatory process here at the board and at the commission. Um, a, a little statu a little fee history. So when Chapter 462 was implemented in 1993, uh, the fees were statutorily set um, at uh, $5 and $25 based on, um, to keep it simple, basically based on prize value. Um, and so the fee was, for, so for most people, the fee was $5. And so that $5 fee stayed in existence from 1993 until 2019, was never changed. When assembly, when AB 117 passed, um, based on the amounts every year at the board, 
um, from people who complain that they have um, somehow been cheated out of winning at a charitable lottery or a charitable game held by a qualified organization. Uh, we uh, raised the fee to $25 in, um, in regulation, held multiple workshops, um, multiple hearings on these regulations. Um, and then after they were passed, uh, the board and the commission did not receive many complaints about the fees we received, more so confusion on how to apply. And we worked with every qualified organization um, on how to do that. Um, the way the fee waiver process worked um, for some organizations that held, for example, a Knights of Columbus that might hold a weekly bingo where it's the same type of event every two weeks. Um, we, the fee waiver process allowed them to submit one application for the entire year for half of a year and just pay that one $25 fee. Um, so the, re the regulatory process from the board and commission's point of view worked um, and the board and commission um, will absolutely and obviously follow whatever gets put into state statute regarding charitable gaming and charitable lotteries. I think I saw another question from Assemblyman Wheeler. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Yeah, uh, kind of looking at this and I'm seeing what the organizations, uh, you know, are included and which tells me what which are excluded. And I'm wondering why we're not including in here um, organizations not filed as a 501c3, why we're not, you know, like, um, you know, uh, as Assemblywoman Krasner said, women's clubs, uh, uh, you know, small neighborhood organizations, et cetera, that would be violating the law if they held some kind of small raffle. But by the same token, since uh, we've got a whole lot of members of the bar on this committee, the bar association is on here. So um, it, it's escaping me why we aren't broadening this out to let some of these small organizations. When we did this in 2019, everyone agreed that, oops, we messed up. We kind of included this huge umbrella and just didn't think about it. And we were going to come back in this session and fix it. So, and I, as I said, I do have a bill on that, but I just, it's escaping me. Why aren't we including some of these smaller clubs that are not organized as a 501c3 and basically don't have the money to go out and, uh, uh, you know, organize as a 501c3 because that usually takes uh, an attorney to do that. Uh, Steve Yeager, for the record, I do believe the bar associations in the state are 501c3. So I think that might answer that question. And, you know, I guess uh, what I would say is um, I want the bill to remain very simple and just deal with the fees. I think you bring up um, an interesting point that perhaps could be a uh, discussion for another day. Um, I don't know the history of, of why the organizations were chosen the, the way they are. My guess is that when this was put into statute, there was a focus on truly the, the nonprofit organizations to say they should essentially be allowed to run these small games. But so I, I guess I would say I'm not necessarily opposed to looking at that. I just would prefer not to do it in the context of Assembly Bill 202. So I've, I've gotten some other requests as well for amendments. And I've just said I'd like love to see the bill just go through to address the fee issue. And perhaps uh, we can address the other issues if need be in other legislation, perhaps including yours, Assemblyman Wheeler. It sounds like you have a piece of legislation on that topic. Yeah, I, be I believe three of us do because we, Nate. <laughs> So thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll talk offline. Thank you. And I don't have any other further questions that people have messaged me about, but does anyone have any further questions regarding Assembly Bill 202 for Chair Yeager? Seeing none, I will go ahead and we will start testimony and support opposition in neutral of Assembly Bill 202. Um, I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom to testify in support. Um, so broadcast services, if we can go to the line and um, start the queue. To testify in support of Bill AB202, press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Would the caller with the last three digits of 974 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Caller with the last three digits of 974, press star six to unmute yourself and begin your testimony. Hello, caller. I can see that you've unmuted yourself. Go ahead and begin your testimony. To testify in support of Bill AB202, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Once again, we're going to go back to the caller with the last three digits of 974. If you would press star six to unmute yourself and then state your name and spell your name for the record, you'll have two minutes and may begin now. You know, it, it, it's okay, broadcast services. It looks like there might be some difficulty. I see that potential caller on the line. I'm not sure. Um, I see they're registered to testify in support of this bill, but if they are unable to get on or don't understand the process of unmuting themselves, I would encourage them to please submit any of their comments in writing um, within 48 hours of the close of today's hearing on Assembly Bill 202. Um, and with that, do we have any other callers on the line? We just had someone uh, sign into the meeting. So we are currently testifying in support of Bill AB202. To provide testimony, press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, at this time, we don't have any callers in support of Bill AB202. And do we have any callers in opposition of Assembly Bill 202? Let's see. Uh, to testify in opposition of Bill AB202, press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we don't have any callers in opposition of the bill at this time. And broadcast services, finally, do we have anyone in neutral on Assembly Bill 202? To testify in the neutral position on Bill AB202, press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Would the caller with the last three digits of, six, of 767 please slowly state and spell your name for the record? You will have two minutes and may begin now. Hello, I'm Denise Quirk, first name D-E-N-I-S-E, -E, last name Quirk, Q-U-I-R-K. Good morning, Chairman Yeager and members of the committee. I am honored to be the elected voice of the Governor's Advisory Committee on Problem Gambling here with our message regarding legislation involving Nevadans under the age of 18 participating in any gambling activity, including charitable games or lotteries. The ACPG strongly endorses maintaining a minimum age for any gambling activity. There should be no distinction between cash or merchandise as prizes and no exception to the minimum age that is there to prevent risk to young people. Science points to early exposure to gambling as one of the most significant factors increasing the risk of problems in later years. March is Problem Gambling Awareness Month, and we encourage everyone to read the Governor's Proclamation and other useful information found on the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling's website. The theme this year is Awareness Plus Action, and we at the ACPG encourage learning what gambling is, what problem gambling is, and what is available for knowledge, prevention, and care for all Nevadans. 
Thank you. And again, I'm Denise Quirk, the Vice Chair of the ACPG, CEO and Clinical Director of the Reno Problem Gambling Center, and Board Member of the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling. Thank you for your testimony. Um, that was testimony in neutral of Assembly Bill 202. Um, I'm actually going to recategorize that as public comment. I don't think it necessarily um, has a neutral effect on the bill that we are currently hearing. So um, if I could have the committee staff go ahead and recategorize that as public comment. Um, and broadcast services, do we have anyone else in neutral? Yes, Chair. Would the caller with the last three digits of 905 Please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. For the record, I am Fred Wagger, F-R-E-D-W-A-G-A-R. I'm Deputy Director of Operations for Nevada Department of Veteran Services, and I'm here to testify in the neutral on AB 202. Chairman Yeager, Vice Chair Wynn, and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee, as noted, AB 202 would impose annual fees for qualified organizations not to exceed $10 if the total value of the prizes offered by the qualified organization in the same calendar year is not more than $100,000. Each year prior to a legislative session, Nevada Department of Veterans Services and the United Veterans Legislative Council host Veterans Legislative Symposia to gather the veterans together to obtain concepts for legislation in Nevada. During the symposia, those concepts are then prioritized. During the 2020 Veterans Legislative Symposium, hosted by UVLC and NDBS, an issue, while not in the top 10, was brought forth by the veterans, which stated, the state of Nevada should change NRS 462 and the Gaming Control Board Regulation 4A. The intent of this uh, non-prioritized item was to reduce fees for local groups, including veterans organizations who raise money to support local veteran activities. Chairman Yeager, uh, Vice Chair Wynn, and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee, thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony in neutral. Broadcast services, do we have any additional testimony in neutral on Assembly Bill 202? To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 202, press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Ma'am, at this time, we don't have any more callers in the neutral position. Thank you, Broadcast Services. Um, and at this time, I will turn it back over to Chair Yeager if you have any closing statements to make in support of Assembly Bill 202. Thank you so much, Madam Vice Chair. Steve Yeager, Assembly District 9. I did want to note the caller in support, who I think was having some technical difficulties, had been communicating with me over the past few months. And her name is, first name is Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E, and last name, Balator. Hopefully I spelled that right, B-A-L-L-A-T-O-R-E. I had worked with her um, on the concept in the bill, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if she submits something in writing or communicates with the committee and just wanted to acknowledge uh, that she, I think, was on the phone but having some issues there. Um, I also just want to thank those who called in um, to talk about the problem gaming aspect. I um, always appreciate the work that they do. Um, I had some communications about proposed amendments, but as I stated um, to, in response to Assemblyman Wheeler's question, uh, my goal here is to keep this bill very simple. I think there are certainly other concepts that are worthy of consideration and discussion, but my preference would be not to do it in the context of Assembly Bill 202 because I think it's important that we get this bill through and make sure those fees are reduced um, and not have this bill held up with some of these other uh, definitely more controversial propositions that have been brought up. So with that, Madam Vice Chair Committee, I appreciate your time and attention and your questions, and I hope to gain your support on Assembly Bill 202. Thank you. And with that, I will close testimony and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 202 and welcome back our chair um, to per, um, back to the committee. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam Vice Chair, for running that part of the meeting. And that now brings us to the first bill that's listed on our agenda. I will open up the bill hearing on Assembly Bill 201. Assembly Bill 201 revises provisions relating to informants. And we have our own Assemblywoman Gonzalez to present the bill. And she has a couple of folks with her 
to present. And before I get started, I just want to find my notes here so I can let you know who those two are. Um, we have Jen C. Anderson, who is the legal director of the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center, and Nathaniel Erb, who is state policy advocate of the Innocence Project. So Assemblywoman Gonzalez, obviously welcome you uh, to present the bill and, and welcome to our guests that are here on the Zoom with us. We'll give you a chance to present and then I'm sure we'll have some questions. So Assemblywoman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chair Yeager and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Cecilia Gonzalez, um, representing Assembly District 16 in Clark County. And I'm here to present Assembly Bill 201. Um, as stated with me today is Jen C. Anderson, the legal director of the Rocky Mountains of the Innocence Project, and Nathaniel Erb, the state policy advocate of the Innocence Project. Last session, this body passed Assembly Bill 267, which compensated people who were wrongfully convicted. When DeBarlow Berry went to prison in 1994 for a murder he did not commit, it was a jailhouse informant who was, incriminating, who was an incriminating witness. Based on the informant's testimony, Mr. Berry was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. In 2014, the informant admitted that he had lied and also received benefits for his false testimony. Testimony from jailhouse informants is one of the leading contributions to wrongful, wrongful convictions, playing a role in nearly one in five of the 367 DNA-based exoneration cases nationwide. So who is an informant? An informant is an individual who provides testimony or information about statements the defendant made while they were incarcerated together. Informants often receive a benefit from prosecutors uh, for information such as, I'm sorry, usually in the form of a plea bargain or a reduced sentence on their own criminal charge or a complete dismissal of their own case. Informants can also receive financial incentives or other special benefits while in custody for their testimony. At the very least, the use of jailhouse informant, sorry, the use of jailhouse and sentence is a distortion to our criminal justice system, and more importantly, the use of unregulated jailhouse informant testimonies sent innocent people to prison. Chair, at this time, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Ms. Anderson to give more details on cases involving informants and how this bill safeguards against false informant testimony. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me this morning. Uh, my name is Jancy Anderson. I am the legal director of the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center. Uh, we're based in Salt Lake City, Utah, but we cover the states of Utah, Wyoming, and Nevada. Um, I'm also a professor of law at the University of Utah College of Law, where I uh, supervise an innocence clinic where students learn how to do work uh, for individuals who have been wrongfully convicted. Uh, I was asked to come here today to speak to you about the problem that we're trying to address here, um, or the problems, um, and also because I was deeply involved in the exoneration of DeMarlo Berry. Um, as Assemblywoman Gonzalez pointed out, DeMarlo was an individual, some of you may know DeMarlo from the session in 2019. Um, I believe he testified in front of this committee at that time. Uh, he couldn't be here today, but I was asked to share a little bit more about his story. Um, in 1994, DeMarlo was convicted of a murder that he did not commit. There was no physical evidence that, con that connected DeMarlo to the scene. Um, there were 13 eyewitnesses and only one of them could uh, identify or, or did identify DeMarlo um, in a photo lineup. And while DeMarlo was uh, incarcerated in the Clark County Jail, he was put into a holding cell with an individual named Richard Iden. And Richard Iden uh, was pulled out of that holding cell and by police and prosecutors. And he told them that DeMarlo Berry had confessed his involvement in the murder. Uh, and as a result, um, Richard Iden, who had been extradited from Ohio, to face multiple charges in both Clark County and Washoe County was given really remarkable benefits. Not only were his cases in Clark County and Washoe County reduced and or dismissed, he was also awarded several trips uh, back to Ohio uh, to be with his father who was dying of cancer. 
Uh, he was given room and board and compensation for his trips back to Nevada when where he was preparing for trial testimony and when he testified at trial. And because there was so little other evidence against Marlo Berry, Richard Iden's testimony played a huge part in his conviction um, and his sentence to life in prison in the Nevada State Department of Corrections. Uh, we took the case on in 2010, uh, knowing that it was going to be a difficult case, that there was no DNA that could exonerate uh, DeMarlo. And we began looking at the case. And in 2014, uh, the actual perpetrator of the crime, well, early in 2011, the actual perpetrator of the crime confessed to the murder. Um, and we then met with Richard Iden uh, to tell him that the actual perpetrator had confessed to see if there was anything he had to add or anything he had to say. And as after asking me whether there was a penalty for perjury, which I told him I couldn't advise him on that if he wanted a lawyer that he would need to get one that because I was representing DeMarlo, he admitted to us in detail uh, that he had lied about the confession that DeMarlo had never even spoken with him that he had never seen DeMarlo before uh, he testified against him in court and that he understood that he was responsible for DeMarlo's wrongful conviction and that he wanted to make it right. Uh, we then brought the case um, and after fighting us for four years, the Clark County District Attorney's Office agreed that based on both the confession of the actual perpetrator and Mr. Iden's recantation that DeMarlo was indeed an innocent man and that the charge against it should be dismissed. And 23 years after he went to prison um, as a 19 year old and at 42 years old, DeMarlo Berry came home from prison. Um, in 2020, um, based on your, your uh, uh, legislation from the last session, um, Assembly Bill 267, DeMarlo was awarded compensation for the time he spent in prison. And he also has recently settled a civil suit that was brought against the Clark County, against Clark County, based primarily on the use of that jailhouse snitch. And the reason that I tell you all of this information is just so that you understand that DeMarlo's case really is illustrates perfectly what the problems are with jailhouse snitches. I mean, first of all, and jailhouse informants, and I apologize um, for calling for using the word snitch. Um, I've always said um, we, I, I've always had a hard time calling them informants because I find that very often they don't have information um, that's real. And, and that's really the first problem is that jailhouse for informants are inherently unreliable. You know, in other words, they lie. You know, they lie to get benefits. They lie to get leniency. Um, and although some may be truthful, and, and certainly this legislation doesn't suggest we should never use them, um, we know that they lie and that they get benefits. And and Richard Iden was exactly that person. And this legislation would address that. You know, and second, because often the benefits that they receive are hidden um, or are not disclosed to defense counsel, the use of jailhouse informants really does result in the conviction of innocent people like DeMarlo Berry. Uh, the National Registry of Exoneration shows that at least 10% of the, uh, at a, about 10% of the recorded exonerations in this country have included jailhouse informants. And Nevada is not immune. Um, DeMarlo is not the only case. And at least 15% of the recorded exonerations in Nevada um, also include jailhouse informants. And I will tell this committee that in the next six months, uh, the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center will be bringing two additional cases of innocence, both of which involve jailhouse informants. Uh, so there's a real danger here, uh, a real danger that the innocents are innocent are gonna be convicted. And not only that, but there's a real, pro a real, a real problem that of the possibility of constitutional violations, not only for the innocent, but for the guilty. And, you know, that's not a technicality, that's important. And our system relies on uh, being constitutionally um, correct. And if 
we use jailhouse informants, we risk that not only that not only the innocent will be convicted, but that uh, the guilty will have their convictions overturned because jailhouse informants information has not been provided to defense counsel. And in DeMarlo's case, none of the information about Richard Iden's deals were provided. Uh, finally, I really think that, I mean, really the use of jailhouse informants hurts the victims of crimes. You know, in DeMarlo Berry's case, the system failed the victim. Uh, the wrong person was convicted and sent to prison for 23 years. And it wasn't until the recantation by the victim and, and the confession by the actual perpetrator that that victim got any kind of justice. Even more than that, and, and, and in addition to that, the criminal justice can also fail a victim when a defendant who's incarcerated receives a benefit in one case for in order to get leniency in another case, which is why this bill addresses that issue. And so for all of these reasons, I would ask that, and because AB 201 really acts to fix this part of our system that convicts the innocent um, and, the, and bipartisan lawmakers around the country have supported this kind of legislation, I urge you to support um, AB 201 up to really talk more about the, the bill itself, I'm gonna turn my the time over to Nathaniel Erb, who is the state policy director for the Innocence Project. And again, I thank you so much for your time and am happy to answer any questions now or after the presentation. Uh, thank you, Ms. Anderson. I just, uh, before we go to Mr. Erb, I just wanted to thank you uh, for the work that you and the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center did on behalf of DeMarlo Berry. Um, we have, talked about his case a couple times this session. And although we have a lot of new members on this committee, uh, you, some of us were here last session and, and obviously we're, uh, we're very compelled by, by his situation and frankly by his grace uh, that he exhibited once he was released. So just wanted to take a moment to, to thank you for that work. I know it was years in the making and it was hard work, but hopefully uh, you and your team can, can look back and feel a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment that it, it took a while, but uh, we finally got there. So thank you for, for sharing that and for your work. Mr. Erb, you so Mr. Erb, if you're with us, I would ask you to welcome you to the committee and ask you to go ahead and talk a little bit about the bill that's in front of us. And then after you are finished, we'll have questions, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, I assume everyone can hear me all right. Great. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Nathaniel Erb here on behalf of the Innocence Project in support of AB 201. The Innocence Project represents the wrongfully convicted. We work with legislators and courts to implement policies that address the causes of wrongful conviction, which is why we are here today. Jailhouse informants or in-custody witnesses have a concerningly outsized representation in cases of wrongful conviction. AB 201 addresses these key issues amongst those that my colleague Jensi and Assemblywoman Gonzalez have pointed out. This is not the first time that the state has considered this issue. In fact, as early as 2008, the Criminal Defense Bar recommended these exact provisions to the Advisory Commission on the Administration of Justice. Yet, repeatedly over the years, the district attorney's offices, in good faith, have rebuffed this effort saying that they were going to take care of it internally. And, and organizations like myself has supported them and waited for that to happen. Most recently, the District Attorney Association finally voted to adopt some of the provisions of this bill in all offices proactively by 2019. However, last December, our office submitted Nevada Open Records Act requests to all offices, which showed that this still was not the case nearly two years later. Assembly Bill 201 would finally remedy this issue. The language is based on these discussions and mirrors ALEC model policy and measures adopted across the states. The bill does four simple things. First, it would require that all DA offices maintain that list of informants used and the benefits they received. This will ensure that prosecutors have historical knowledge about the reliability of witnesses and can count on other offices to have that knowledge as well. So if they are using an informant, they can check with other offices to say, hey, have you used this person in the case? How were they reliable? Were there any issues? Second, it would require prosecutors to disclose benefits and specific evidence to the offense within 45 days of trial, unless the judge determines that that's not feasible for any particular types of evidence. While the Supreme Court already covered this, established that these provisions and this type of evidence is required uh, under Brady and Giglio in their progeny, it didn't provide specifics. 
our cases and discussions with prosecutors prove it is not always clear what information is necessary. If the state discloses this evidence late, incompletely, or not at all, the accused cannot prepare an adequate defense. Establishing prompt, specific disclosures ensures that the tools in our legal system are available to all people in all cases. Further, the bill provides a safety valve of judges' ability to adjust the timeline if required. Third, the, if the informant's testimony is admitted, jurors would be instructed to consider certain reliability factors when addressing their statements, when assessing their statements, I apologize. Every day people, every day people do not necessarily understand the intricacies of how informants come to be involved in a case and what is motivating them. Jurors should simply be brought up to the same level of understanding that prosecutors and defenses, defense has in order to weigh the evidence appropriately. The last thing, the bill would ensure that victims of any informant's crimes who receives leniency would be notified. The victim's informant should be notified if leniency is provided in any exchange for testimony. If justice and the involvement of a victim under provisions such as Marcy's Law matter one day, they should matter the next. Now, in talking about implementation and cost savings, AB 201, we view as a very valuable use for the state. As my colleague mentioned, cases like DeMarco Berry, Fred Steiss, uh, infor all involved informant cases. Across the country, $290 million has been paid out in civil awards alone from states in cases like these. Just last week, it was announced that Fred Steese would be awarded $1.4 million in compensation. Tamarlo Berry, who was previously an exoneree who received compensation, he reached a settlement for $1.5 million with Clark County. This does not account for the cost of court cases, the damages to communities for incarcerating the innocent, and overlooking the actually those that actually committed the crimes. These regulations would improve judicial efficiency by reducing appeals for an unconstitutionally withheld evidence. Additionally, by clarifying when and what types of incentivized witnesses, witness information must be disclosed, there would be fewer court delays and resources spent litigating these cases. In our testimony this morning, we also provided information from Connecticut and Texas who have adopted these very same policies and showed how this could be done simply through word systems, Excel sheets, or in-house uh, technology products at little to no cost. In fact, Connecticut and Texas both reported both prior to uh, uh, the adoption of the legislation and after the fact that all the workflow that was needed was adopted into the regular budgets that they had already established. In conclusion, Assembly Bill 201 will improve the reliability of evidence and prevent wrongful convictions, enhance community safety, and protect Nevada. It is for these reasons that the Innocence Project supports AB 201. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Mr. Erb. Um, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, any further remarks before we take questions? Nope, we will definitely take questions at this time. Great, so thanks. I, I wanna start out with kind of one overarching question. Um, we've obviously heard a lot of testimony about uh, jailhouse informants and how, that, how they can be problematic, but nothing in this bill would prevent the use of a jailhouse informant. Uh, the way I read it is it's, the issue is that that information that there was a jailhouse informant and the incentives that were offered, that needs to be disclosed to the defense counsel so they can prepare an adequate defense. So just wanna make sure um, I have that right, that nothing in the bill itself on its face would prevent the use of jailhouse informants. So if someone could confirm that, please. I can. Um, for the record, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16. Yes, that is correct. This does not prevent or stop or um, restrict the use of any jailhouse informant. Um, this is just adding both protections for the district attorney's office and the um, defendant to use jailhouse informant informants. Thank you. And I know we have some other questions, so I'm going to start first with Assemblywoman Hansen, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to ask some questions. And I'm grateful for the Innocence Project and, and the work they do. And perhaps one of the one of the most fulfilling votes I made last session was on the DeMarlo Berry bill. So I appreciate having had that opportunity. Um, so I'm a, I'm a lay person. So if you can have some patience with me, um, I'm, I have a couple of questions. Section five, section six. In section five, um, where you're asking the bill to require prosecuting attorney to maintain complete and systematic records 
a case is prosecuted by the office in which testimony of an informant was used. I'm a little surprised that you have to ask for that. Isn't that already done? For the record, Nathaniel Err from the Innocence Project. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman, for that good question. Um, I think a lot of this bill has to do with things that we hope would be done proactively, um, but the cases that we have before us and colleagues like Ms. Anderson had, uh, unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, the district attorney's offices, in good faith, this is the provision that in 2018, they had adopted to uh, require all offices to have an internal system for tracking. Um, they are Open Records Act requests submitted last year in December show that there's still some lagging behind. Um, so the provision of this bill would just ensure that other offices would continue to meet that bar and that would go forward in perpetuity regardless of who was in charge, that that internal system for tracking this is in place. Um, it just, there's so much uh, uh, has to be done in these cases. Uh, this is a piece that seems to be missed along the way. But at what we've seen across the country is as soon as this is something prosecuting offices do, they love it because they they know they can rely on other offices that have information to know exactly what happened in that case and was that informant reliable, who to go to, all those details. Uh, the bar is really low for what information needs to be tracked by statute. But uh, I would imagine that the individual offices themselves may go beyond the requirements of legislation to add more information that they find necessary. Um, so hope that answers your question. Thank you for it. Yes, thank you for that. And Chair, if I could, this is my second question. Um, in Section 6, the bill provides that if a prosecuting attorney intends to use testimony of an informant, um, that the following information and materials be provided to the defense would include the criminal history of the informant, a copy of any, you know, cooperating agreement, um, and so on. I, I'm surprised that that's not done already. Um, and is that not part of what we, is discovery the, the proper term, that you would share that information with, with the defense? That's not happening now? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Nathaniel Irv again on behalf of the Innocence Project, and I'll, I'm sure Ms. Anderson may have something to add us as well. I agree. Again, this goes to this information should already be covered under uh, Giglio and uh, Brady and their progeny. Uh, but it's just offices like mine and Ms. Anderson's have just found that that's not, it's not clear. While the Supreme Court, the courts have shown and rules of the court have demonstrated that information that goes to the impeachability of a, of a witness of the state should be handed over. They're not spelling out what that information always is and always in all those cases. So we definitely have cases across the country that we can provide data on, on prosecutorial misconduct in cases like uh, issues that Ms. Anderson brought up. But there's also plenty of times that uh, prosecutors are asking in good faith, they just aren't thinking about these details that needs to be handed over. So by putting this in statute, we're just spelling out that process. I think uh, everyone agrees over the course of the years that this should be handed over, but we just wanna make sure it actually is done because we're not seeing that that's uniformly the case. But it wouldn't go beyond anything that they should already be practically handing on. Thank you, appreciate the answers. Let's go next to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation um, and to the Assemblywoman for bringing the bill. Um, so, so I have, and I have a couple questions, if that's okay, Chair. Um, so in the list of benefits, um, when when um, Professor Anderson was, was telling the the uh, history with Richard Iden. Um, what if Mr. Iden didn't get um, any type of, of benefit as far as um, the reduction in his charges, that type of thing, but it was just trips to go see his father. So he remained in jail or prison. He, um, he didn't get any benefits um, as far as his criminal case but he just got to go see his father before he died. Um, looking under the list of benefits in section three, I don't see that that would necessarily be included. I mean, is that, would that fall under reward or amelioration of the, of the current or future conditions of any terms of sentence? Would, you know, are we capturing those type of things? Because it's, there's sometimes you get more of a benefit 
um, than we're not, than I think we're listing. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Cohen. My my understanding of the definition of benefit was that, as you point out in Section Four, um, that that would be considered either a financial payment or a reward, um, and that perhaps putting a comma after reward would then be the amelioration of any current or future conditions of term of sentence. And that way it would be more clear that financial payment or reward would be separate from any um, leniency that was awarded in any other kinds of cases. Okay, thank you for that. And then I also wanna make sure I was understanding this. Um, when there's the information that the prosecuting attorney maintains and provides, um, regarding um, testimony, um, no, I'm sorry, not just testimony provided, um, regarding benefits, that type of thing. Um, are, we, are we also capturing any offers that were made um, to the police? So not just deals that were made with the prosecuting attorney, but if a, a, a said to the police, hey, I've got this information on this guy, is, is that included as well? That information should be handed over and included if, uh, apologies, uh, Nathaniel Lerb again on behalf of the Innocence Project. Uh, every 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 state has their own uh, system. Uh, that information should be captured if it's in the knowledge of the prosecutors. But we don't entertain uh, in this bill that extra step of, of uh, the prosecutor having to go out of their way and how they go out of their way to make sure they have everything from law enforcement. It would be all what's in the hands of the district attorney's offices at the time uh, and what they know of, um, hopefully. Uh, and I think routinely they are in regular communication with law enforcement uh, about all that type of aspects. And so if it would be captured, if it would be considered uh, under a benefit in going to uh, that information and that testimony, it would be covered within whatever records they are recovering they are recording and placing within the system. Thank you. And I'll just note uh, for the record as well, just as a point of clarification, um, section four of the bill defines informant in this particular bill as you know, someone who was with a defendant while they were in jail or prison together. So there are other informants out there in the community, confidential informants who are not incarcerated, who sometimes work with law enforcement to provide information. Uh, they would not be covered by this particular bill, but there would still be constitutional requirements that that type of information be conveyed to defense attorneys. Um, that that is already required. Uh, there's often you know litigation about what exactly has to be turned over, and especially if you have confidential informants who are working with the police. But I wanted to make clear that this bill contemplates the situation where two or more individuals share a jail or prison cell, and that is usually allegedly where a confession of some kind was made. And also didn't want to leave the committee with the impression that other informants information wouldn't be turned over. It's just not expressly contemplated by the bill in front of us. Let's see if we have additional questions. If anyone has questions, could you raise your hand? I see Assemblyman Orentlicker has one and then Assemblyman O'Neill. So go ahead, Assemblyman Orentlicker. Thank you, uh, Chair Yeager and uh, David Orentlicker for the record, Assembly District 20 and uh, Clark County, and uh, this is a great bill. That's why I'm co-sponsoring it. I'm glad we're bringing this forward. Um, as you talk about the problems with jailhouse informants, it makes me think of similar problems with other kinds of witnesses like co-defendants who might be promised a more lenient sentence if they implicate um, the, another defendant. Uh, do we have to address that as well? Do we have the same kinds of problems? Maybe not as serious, but still significant enough that we should be spelling out that kind of adopting say, similar kinds of safeguards. Thank you, Senator Lutman, uh, for the record, Nathaniel Erb on the Afghanistan's project. Uh, it's your, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I will ask Ms. Anderson to weigh in on that as well. Uh, we want to stay specific to jailhouse informants within the confines of this bill. Um, my office would be happy to discuss with yours of uh, other concerns around other types of witnesses uh, where uh, there's a whole range of issues that we uh, 
lobby on uh, and support. Um, but uh, I wonder if Ms. Anderson might have thoughts to that specific aspect, which is outside the confines of this bill. Um, Jen C. Anderson, legal director of the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center for the record. Uh, uh, thank you, Assemblyman. Um, quite frankly, we don't see as many issues with um, other kinds of witnesses, co-defendants, um, other types of witnesses. Certainly there is sometimes police pressure or, or uh, just the need to lie on the part of co-defendants or other kinds of witnesses, but we don't see as many problems with those kinds of witnesses as we do with the jailhouse informant. And so I think that's why we wanted to attack the problem first with jailhouse informants. Um, we don't see the problems as often with the hiding of evidence in those cases. Um, very often, if a co-defendant decides to testify, that ha that that deal becomes absolutely clear. Um, and so, again, it's it's certainly an issue that can be a problem. But we did want to focus, as as Nathaniel Erb said, um, on this particular issue in this particular bill. We'll go next to Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm trying to figure out where I want to start. And I guess I will say what happened to Mr. Barry is a great example to me of a horrible police investigation, poor prosecution on the DA's part. And I've got to give some uh, horrible or poor defense work too. Because answer, how many times have we had repeat jailhouse offenders that you know of? You said um, you keep stats, 15% of the cases are jail. How many times is it the same jailhouse informant in Nevada that you want to keep records on? Uh, Jen C. Anderson for the, with the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center uh, for the record. Um, Assemblyman O'Neill, that's an excellent question because there certainly is a problem with what we call serial snitches or serial informants. Um, in Nevada, I can honestly say I haven't seen a problem with um, serial informants to date. Um, all of the informants that we've dealt with and are dealing with are uh, in have we only know individually that they've done that. My understanding is that Richard Iden has tried to to um, to give information in other cases and whether he's been able to do that or not, I'm not sure. Um, I can also tell you that when he uh, was rearrested um, after he was released from prison, uh, when he gave the recantation, he actually recanted again in order to try to get, recanted his recantation in order to get more information, in order to get more benefit from the state. Uh, and so the short answer to your question is we haven't seen the serial informant in Nevada yet, um, but we do see them around the country. Let's just talk about Nevada because that's where we are, and that's this law, please. And, and I really take offense at some of your language when you continually call them snitches. Uh, they're informants, just like anybody else. But once they come forward, isn't policy that I know of, and I was in investigation for 30 out of my 40 years on any informant, whether it was from a citizen, John Q. Citizen, that was not under arrest or had any involvement directly, I had to build collaborating evidence, additional information before a case could be brought forward. And I, and over the years, the legal system has matured where particularly on uh, homicides, they require that both the prosecutor and the defense attorney meet certain qualifications, correct? So some of this cannot be repeated, correct? Uh, yes, sir. That's what, and if I appreciate the time, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll try to conclude. So isn't some of this the defense attorney can either through discovery, depositions, or during trial question the informant when they have to testify about have they received any leniency, have they received any, as you say, enumerations, gifts, et cetera, um, on testifying. So to me, 
is that and plus at the time of jury instructions the judge gives instructions to the jury on how to um accept witnesses testimony not just informant but all witnesses that testified Jen C. Anderson for the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center. First of all, Assemblyman O'Neill, I apologize if, for any offense that may have been taken. And I, I, I truly sincerely apologize for that and will try to watch my language um, more carefully. Um, I think you point out exactly the way the system should work. Um, it absolutely should be that defense attorneys ask for discovery, that the prosecution provides all relevant discovery, including any information about um, any witnesses who are testifying in including jailhouse informants that uh, that's then investigated that when they go to trial that the jailhouse uh, informant is honest on the stand that the prosecution if the jailhouse is not honest that the prosecution collects corrects that information that um, the judge then um, gives an, uh, uh, an instruction that deals with all witnesses and then in particular with regards to incarcerated witnesses. Um, but unfortunately, what we found is the system just doesn't work as it was meant to work. So um, where's the defense attorney? Assemblyman O'Neill, can we please let her finish her response? Yes, thank you, Chair. You know, as, you, as you point out, very often, I mean, I, I've very seldom see, seen a case where the defense did not ask for discovery. Um, in fact, I've never seen a case where the defense did not ask for discovery. I have seen cases where that when that discovery is pro pro uh, provided by the prosecution, that information about the testifying witnesses, including informants, is not provided. And that is the case of DeMarlo Berry um, and, and others that I have seen um, in Nevada. And as I said, two that I will be filing um, or that Rocky Mountain Innocence Center will be filing soon. Um, and, and that's an unfortunate, I mean, without an open discovery or open records discovery process that happens and that maybe happen um, in, in on purpose or it may happen negligently, it may happen on accident. And I'm certainly not trying to demonize prosecutors in any way. Unfortunately, in the in the DeBarlow Berry case, it was there was some prosecutorial misconduct. I also agree with you that defense attorneys do not always do their jobs. Uh, but usually I have seen that when there is a jailhouse informant on the stand, they do ask the jailhouse informant about a uh, benefit and the jailhouse informant lies about whether they've received that benefit or they only give partial answer to the, ben to the benefit or the benefit hasn't yet been given. So for example, they're told if their testimony is useful, they will get the benefit so they can testify that they haven't gotten the benefit yet. So there's a whole lot of ways that the system goes wrong. And what we hope to do with this bill is to, to try to fix that. And yes, you are absolutely correct that the justice system has matured, but what has also happened is within the innocence movement, we have discovered these fissures and trends within the criminal justice system, including in Nevada, that we think we can fix or begin to fix with legislation like this that can uh, provide the uh, the mechanism so that these kinds of problems don't continue. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Chair. And I apologize for interrupting Ms. Anderson. That is okay. Thank you, Assemblyman O'Neill. And I just wanted to confirm uh, with, I think with Mr. Erb, and I, we have a number of folks who are going to testify on the bill as well. And I think we have some district attorneys in, in opposition, I think, to specific portions of the legislation. But Mr. Erb, I wanted to just confirm something you said, and that was the, the district attorneys association agreed at some point that they, that each office in the state would adopt a policy around this topic. And I think your testimony was some have and some have not as of a few months ago. Could you just confirm that to make sure we have it right? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, for the record, Nathaniel Erb here on behalf of the Innocence Project. Uh, members, we submitted information that we had historically for working with the various offices uh, on the history of this issue. Um, I believe uh, 
And I don't want to speak out of turn for the district attorney's offices. So this is just what we've discussed in public with them over the years. Uh, in 2008, uh, uh, when the um, defense bar originally brought provisions of this bill for discussion to one of the interim committees, they had agreed the Clark County's office suggested they were developing internal policy, both for the tracking and around how discovery disclosure should be handled. Um, the information I have on the 2018 vote by the association went specifically to section five around the capturing of information about the use of informants and, te and testimony and benefits they provided to. Uh, and so that was the information that we had uh, requested information on through the Open Records Act and found that there were still some offices um, uh, uh, outstanding uh, uh, after the two year window, but we had information that they had voted to do it by 2019. And so we pulled in 2021 and in, uh, in 2020 at the end on the lead up to this. Uh, I have, we haven't talked with the district attorney's office. So I uh, believe that they are working proactively to adopt this. It goes to show that uh, for that portion, it's not a heavy burden and there's plenty of states that have done this. Uh, so by uh, legislating that here in this bill, we just wanna make sure that good practice uh, continues uh, in perpetuity. Thank you, Mr. Urban. Certainly not asking you to speak for the association, but I mean, and they can confirm this. It sounds to me like the need for such a system, a tracking system, and uh, to facilitate discovery and sharing of information that's constitutionally required. The need seems to be clear, and I think folks seem to agree on that. There may be some disagreement about exactly uh, how it should be structured and other provisions of the bill, but we'll have a chance to hear that um, in the support of an opposition testimony. Before we get to that testimony, I did want to ask if any other committee members had additional questions about the bill for our three presenters. I don't see additional questions. You know, before I go to supportive testimony, Mr. Erb, I wanted to thank you and the Innocence Project uh, as well for the work that you did uh, on DeMar Berry's case and the help for the legislation. Uh, many of you remember uh, Ms. Michelle Feldman uh, with the Innocence Project was really instrumental in helping to present last session's exoneration compensation bill. Um, she has moved on from the Innocence Project, so she is no longer there. Uh, but uh, Mr. Erb, if you are still in contact with her, if you could thank her for her work and just thank you and your staff for the really hard work that you do every day. Um, I, for one, will say I wish there was not a need to have an Innocence Project or a Rocky Mountain Innocence Center. Uh, and maybe someday we'll get there, but until then we'll keep working to improve our justice system. So that's enough commentary for me. Um, I'll ask our presenters to just hold tight for a moment. Uh, we'll take testimony and then we'll come back for concluding remarks. So let's start with the Zoom call. Is there anybody in support? We are now on support of testimony. I don't see anyone else on the Zoom with us. So BPS, let's go to the phone lines and see if there's anybody there who'd like to offer support of testimony for Assembly Bill 201. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of Bill AB201, press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Would the caller with the last three digits of 037 please slowly state and spell your name for the record? You will have two minutes and may begin now. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Yeager and members of the judiciary. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I have um, I have submitted um, some documents supporting my conceptual amendment to AB 201. Could you um, please state your name my... for the record? Oh, could, could I'm please... sorry. I guess they, they didn't catch that part. Tanya Brown, spelled T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, -O -O Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. Good morning. Um, I have submitted um, some documents supporting my conceptual amendment to AB 201, and after submitting my exhibits, um, I had forgotten to put in my conceptual amendment together until moments before the deadline. Um, I apologize because I realized that Section 6 of um, the amendment, F and G, uh, of the amendment should have been amended into Section 5, making it subsections 3 and 4. Um, the reason I'm putting this 
in together to, together is because in the original bill in subsection three, subsection four, the words financial payment, I find it somewhat vague, and I want to clarify what I believe it should be should be defined to include the word secret witness. A secret witness is confidential informant that does not have to expose themselves to anyone, including the police and the district attorney, yet the secret witness does have a financial payment interest. The intent of the secret witness program is to provide anonymity to the persons providing the information so that the law enforcement agencies can acquire valuable information and evidence that will lead to the arrest of a suspect and the district attorney's office in obtaining a conviction. However, that may not always be the case. There are some times when there is just a motive other than justice for victim of a crime to contact secret witness. These motives can be a means of getting a financial payment, and without a conviction, there is no financial payment. It can also be a form of retaliation against another person. For those reasons, I'm asking that this committee accept my conceptual amendment to AB 201. Um, with the passing Ms. of Ms. the public Ms. Brown, records request... Ms. Ms. Brown, yeah. Ms. Brown, can I ask you have, you, have you had a chance to talk to the sponsor of the bill about your proposed amendment? No, I have not. Okay, so let me ask you this, because we're in support of testimony. It doesn't sound like the sponsor has agreed to your amendment at this point. So my question is, even if your amendments are not adopted, are you in support of AB 201 as it's written now? Or would you be in opposition if it doesn't include your amendments? I am in, I am in support of this bill, whether or not my conceptual amendment passes is accepted and passes definitely in favor of this um i'm only putting this in because i want it in the back of your mind that there's other things involved that's not even mentioned in the bill and some of the testimony that is coming forward in this amendment actually can help what is being discussed okay so but no that's fine miss brown I, I, I just wanted to I just wanted to make sure that we were accurately categorizing your testimony. And so we've had a little bit of an exchange, right. but if you want to please go ahead and wrap up your supportive testimony, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Um, with the passing of the public records request, it is also possible that newly discovered evidence can be found in those public records, evidence that can point to a state's witness as being a secret witness. In the uh, conceptual amendment, uh, like I said, I just put this together at the last minute yesterday, just before the deadline. So it, it doesn't, you know, anyway, <clears throat> I just want to put in here what I've, uh, what I've had in there that kind of answers some of the questions that are being asked <clears throat> in it under um, section five, number two, and the records described in section one are confidential. And I've added, unless deemed by a court order to be released or turned over to the defense and must remain a public record, are not public books or records, meaning the meaning of NRS 239.010. And then I added a subsection. If at any time the district attorney receives an allegation of an informant or a state's witness receiving monies from the secret witness program, the district attorney's office must disclose the following information or material to the defense as soon as possible, regardless if the defense has already appeared before the court, is working on an appeal, post-conviction petition, writ of habeas corpus, or the defendant is in pro se or has no petition or appeal pending, they must be notified. And section four, subsection four, I've added, the district attorney's office must keep records of these allegations for possible comparisons to other trial and hearing testimonies that may have been given in court. All these records must be provided to the defense and or the defendant. Um, that's what I have to say, but yes, I'm definitely in favor of and support this bill as written without my conceptual amendment. Thank you for a wonderful day. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Brown. And for members of the committee, members of the public, the proposed amendment that Ms. Brown referenced is available on Nellis as an exhibit. So that has been uploaded. But again, at this point, the sponsor uh, has not agreed to that amendment. So it is not viewed as a friendly amendment. But as Ms. Brown stated, I think she's in support of the bill, regardless of whether that amendment is ultimately accepted. So we'll categorize her testimony as supportive. BPS, let's go to the next caller in support, please. With the caller with the last three digits of 318, please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. This is Kendra Burchie.
A-E-N-D-R-A-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-Y, with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I want to start by thanking the Assemblywoman Gonzalez, the Rocky Mountain Innocence Project, and the Innocence Project for all of their work to ensure that justice is served in Nevada. This is a crucial bill to ensuring that Nevada has a policy of, make, of making changes to ensure justice for those involved in the criminal justice system. That Nevada is actively engaging in steps to do our best to not convict innocent community members. We appreciate the portions of this bill that require transparency and not a trial by ambush. There were a lot of questions regarding discovery. Discovery issues is something that defense attorneys consistently have to litigate. This provides clarity to our discovery process. We are continuing to work with the sponsor to ensure that defense attorneys are able to adhere to our responsibilities of ethical duties and other duties to our clients. The Innocence Project has been diligently working on this issue for several years, and we appreciate their hard work, and now is the time to protect our community members. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Burchie. BPS, let's take the next caller, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 037 please slowly state and uh, spell your name for the record? You will have two minutes and may begin now. Diane Goldstein, G-O-L-D-S-T-E-I-N. Distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony in support of AB 201. After retiring as a lieutenant from my policing career, I now serve as the executive director of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. LEAP is a nonprofit group of police, prosecutors, and other criminal justice professionals who work to make communities safer by focusing law enforcement resources on the greatest threats to public safety and healing police community relations. Leading the crisis negotiations team for my police department, I saw for firsthand the importance to public safety of our communities having trust and confidence in the justice system. Crisis negotiation is all about winning the trust of people in crisis. Research underscores that policing in general depends on community trust because without it, people do not report crime or cooperate with, that, with law enforcement. One reason police don't trust the criminal justice system is that they have witnessed or experienced unfair trials and investigations, resulting in wrongful convictions. An important source of wrongful convictions is testimony from jailhouse informants. Multiple people convicted due to the false testimony of jailhouse informants have been exonerated in Nevada, where I live. Media coverage of these wrongful convictions destroys the community trust we rely on to say nothing of the financial cost of appeals and retrials. AB 201 would protect Nevadans from false jailhouse informant testimony. Many states, including Oklahoma, Florida, Connecticut, Illinois, Maryland, Nebraska, and Texas, already regulate jailhouse informant testimony. Prosecutors track which jailhouse informants are testifying in which cases. Defense attorneys and juries are informed that the person is a jailhouse informant and if that person is receiving benefits in exchange for testifying. This bill will bring Nevada up to speed with these other states with a negligible cost for prosecutors' offices. Texas and Connecticut prosecutors' offices reported little to no impact on budgets and workloads to track the use of informants. In short, I support AB 201, as does my organization, because I know firsthand how important it is to improve trust in the justice system. When we take common sense steps to improve public trust, we get more, more cooperation and we keep communities safer. Thank you for the opportunity to share my experience in support of this bill. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Goldstein. BPS, let's take the next caller in support, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 611 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Good morning, Chairman Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. This is John Pirro, J-O-H-N-P-I-R-O from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. I'd like to thank the sponsors for bringing this bill forward and for the and also thank the Innocence Project for all the time they have spent staying on top of this issue. This is a problem in Nevada, not just around the United States, that needs to be corrected. And this is a common sense step in trying to prevent wrongful convictions. This bill lays out a framework to do that. Uh, and we do have this issue in Nevada. I'd like to echo the comments of the people that came before me and uh, 
ask this committee to please pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Pirro. BPS, let's take the next caller in support. Would the caller with the last three digits of 725 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, and thank you, Chair Yeager and committee members. This is Nick Shepak, N-I-C-K-S-H-E-P-A-C-K, Policy and Program Associate with the ACLU of Nevada. I want to start by thanking Assemblywoman Gonzalez and the Innocent Project for bringing forth this important bill. They did a great job of explaining when this bill is necessary. I want to talk a bit about my experience as a master's level social work intern at the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I worked with individuals accused of Category A felonies. While these individuals and crime, while the individuals and crimes varied greatly, uh, one thing that was uniform was the fear that you could see in the eyes of these defendants when they received their plea deals. I often spent hours with these individuals, helping them deal with. Uh, the situation in their mental health as they were in the aftermath of receiving these deals that were often for a decade or more in state prison. I can only describe this fear as true fight or flight. I imagine it is the same fear that is felt when one's life is in imminent danger. There's no real way to fight your way out of county jail, and fleeing is not an option. While I am deeply upset by those who provide false information, I understand and I have seen the fear and the desperation in individuals facing long prison sentences. Because of this, we need safeguards to make sure that any information provided by a jailhouse informant is in fact true. This bill provides those safeguards, and for this reason and the reasons presented by those before me, I ask you to support this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Shepak. BPS, let's take the next caller in support. We are currently uh, testifying in support of Bill AB201. If you'd like to uh, testify in support, press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Would the caller with the last three digits of 018 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning. My name is Jim Sullivan, J-I-M-S-U-L-L-I-D-A-M, and I represent the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. The Culinary Union supports AB 201 because we believe that it would protect Nevadans against false jailhouse informant testimony, which has led to wrongful convictions and cost the state millions of dollars. During the 2019 legislative session, we heard the heartbreaking story of Lamar Berry who did 22 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, largely due to false jail health informant testimony. Unfortunately, DeMarlo is not alone. Bad jail health informant testimony has also played a part in the exoneration of Fred C., who served over 20 years for a crime he did not commit. Jail health informant has played a big role in all of these cases, and Nevadans needs legislation to ensure this injustice never happens again. AB 201 does just that. Tracking jailhouse informant use and requiring prosecutors to disclose specific details about jailhouse informants, such as the details of any deals they received in exchange for testimony and any other cases that they may have benefited from testimony, is smart and common sense policy. These are simple fixes, simple fixes that will help ensure no other Nevadan has years of their life stolen from them due to wrongful convictions. Last session, the Assembly Judiciary Committee did the right thing by ensuring that exonerated Nevadans were compensated for the time they served due to wrongful convictions. Now we must make sure that no other Nevadans have decades of their lives taken from them because of false testimony from jailhouse informants. This bill will help make that a reality, and the Culinary Union urges you to vote yes on AB 201. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Sullivan. BPS, let's take the next caller in support. Would the caller with the last three digits of 130 slowly state and then spell your name for the record? You will have two minutes and we begin now. Good morning. My name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. And I'm the policy director with Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada. 
I also just want to echo the sentiments of those who spoke before me and add our support for this legislation to the record. We urge you to act to ensure these common sense safeguards are put in place. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Saunders. BPS, let's take the next caller, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 556 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Anne-Marie Grant, A-N-N-E-M-A-R-I-E-G-R-A-N-T. I am in support of Assembly Bill 201 with or without amendments. However, I would urge the sponsor of the bill to take a look at Ms. Brown's amendment. I think the suggestion is good that secret witness possibly be included in the language, as I will give you an example of a case that is a problem case that is not a jailhouse informant. I believe the Nolan Klein case is one that applies to the question some of the members were asking about and urge you to read the sworn affidavit submitted by Ms. Brown as it applies to several of your questions that have been asked today and should affect future law changes. Information was discovered, the trial was in 1999. 1989, information was discovered in 2009 when Judge Brent Adams issued an order to turn over the entire file. The state's witness, Miss Gritter, was an informant, and she was the person who identified Mr. Klein's voice on the 911 call. Mr. Klein had received information from witnesses that Miss Gritter was the secret witness and was paid $2,000. None of this was revealed during trial to Mr. Klein or his defense attorneys. 1991, Ms. Gritter contact, was contacted by an investigator in a post-conviction appeal for Klein, um, who tried to subpoena her. He was never able to, as she didn't go to work till after the hearing. Ms. Gritter wrote a letter to DDA, Washoe County, Ron Rachow, asking him what she should do. Ms. Gritter hid from the investigator. She was never served and never had to testify or answer, was she the secret witness? On page 70 of Ms. Brown's affidavit, it says that in October and November of 2019-18, this information had been discussed and provided to Ms. Jennifer Noble at Washoe DA's Conviction Integrity Committee. In the exhibit, there is correspondence between Mr. Plater, who was the defendant's attorney for the post-conviction. Plater sent the investigator, who was neighbor, never able to contact her. Um, a post, at post-conviction, it was raised that the defendant had received two separate letters from two separate people saying Gritter was the secret witness. Ms. Gritter herself wrote a letter to the defendant discussing the secret witness. These letters were to be brought forward to the court at the post-conviction hearing, but when the defendant received a property at the jail waiting for the hearing, the letters were missing. Including secret witness could possibly prevent secret witnesses who are unknown to prosecutors or to the defense and avoid injustices. I fully support the bill either way. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Grant. BPS, do we have other callers in support? Yes, Chair. Would the caller with the last three digits of 080 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hi, Jim Hoffman, representing Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice. We support this bill for the reason that many of the previous people have uh, mentioned. And I would just like to make the further point that the point of the court system is to find the truth, right? It's to determine whether, in this case, the defendant actually did commit a crime or not. So many of our evidence rules, our procedural rules, are just about making sure that the jury has the facts, that they have the truth, to figure out what actually happened. The point of this bill is simply to give those facts to the jury. It doesn't compel any particular holding. It's keeping in place the basic principle that the jury decides whether someone is guilty or innocent just making sure that we're actually getting at the truth. Uh, and we support the truth, and that's why we support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hoffman. BPS, are there other callers in support? We are currently taking testimony in support of Bill AB201. Press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in support of Bill AB201. Thank you so much, BPS. I'm going to close testimony in support. I will now open it up for testimony in opposition. We don't have anyone with us on the Zoom in opposition, but I believe we have a few folks on the phone. BPS, could we go to the phone and take the first caller for opposition testimony, please? To testify in opposition of Bill AB201, 
Press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Would the caller with the last three digits of 389 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Noble. I am a Chief Deputy District Attorney in the Washoe County District Attorney's Office, and I am here testifying on behalf of the Nevada District Attorney's Association in opposition to Assembly Bill 201. I'd like to begin by thanking the Assemblywoman and the Innocence Project for meeting with us regarding our concerns. Oh. By way of background, the NDAA worked on this issue with the Innocence Project as part of an ACAJ working group in a prior interim session. Because we recognize that testimony from incarcerated persons at trial regarding information that they learned while they were incarcerated raises legitimate concerns regarding wrongful convictions. When an incarcerated witness or any witness testifies at trial, the defense is entitled to know what benefit they receive under Brady and Giglio so that they can conduct an adequate cross-examination. And that's what didn't happen in the DeMarlo Berry case. We are always mindful of our discovery obligations, our constitutional disclosure obligations. They're part of our special ethical duties as prosecutors. Jailhouse informant testimony is used rarely and prosecutors are always bound by the constitution. However, in recognition of the Innocence Project concerns, we developed a model jailhouse informant policy in early 2019. That policy requires the tracking and disclosure of cooperation agreements with jailhouse informants and disclosure about that agreement and the information underlying it in any subsequent case. Just yesterday afternoon, I was able to verify that the district attorney's offices of Washoe, Clark, Carson City, Churchill, Douglas, Humboldt, Lincoln, Elko, Pershing, Merrill, Story, and Nye counties have policies regarding the disclosure of such information and the tracking of that information. So the DA of Eureka County informed me that they didn't adopt a written policy because they don't use jailhouse informant testimony, period. I'm still trying to connect with our smaller counties, White Pine, Esmeralda, and Lander, to verify their status, but it's important to remember that some offices have had changes in leadership since 2019, and so policies may, be, have, may have been lost in that transition. But even without policies, prosecutors have these constitutionally derived obligations of discovery and disclosure. The Assemblywoman stated that the object of this bill is to guard against false information from jailhouse informants, but its sweeping provisions cover instances in which there's no testimony at all. Section 4, sub 1 defines an informant who provides, quote, testimony or information. And indeed, that phrase is used throughout the bill and is the cause of many of our concerns. The repeated use of, quote, or information throughout the bill requires law enforcement to burn informants, even when we are able to independently verify the information they provide, and they never testify against the defendant. Section 4, sub 2 provides that an informant is someone who, quote, may receive a benefit for testimony or information. This presents a very real safety concern for incarcerated persons who are particularly vulnerable to retaliatory violence while they're incarcerated. Although Section 6, sub 3 allows the court to find that disclosing the informant's identity could result in substantial bodily harm, his or her identity is still revealed to the defense counsel and there's no mechanism or consequence to any attorney who provides that information to their client. This discourages inmates from speaking up regarding in incidents of prison violence because their identities are going to be revealed even if they never testify in a proceeding. This impedes the ability of us, of our, our ability rather, to address organized crime in prison and the rising violence of those who provide information in prisons, prison violence cases. Additionally, informants may offer information that they hope will benefit them at sentencing with no inducement or offer even contact from law enforcement. Their information is not solicited and it's never used. But their defense counsel may still argue that they assisted law enforcement at sentencing even when they didn't. We can't stop those arguments from being made. But Section 4 imposes disclosure obligations on prosecutors even when no information is requested or used and no inducement or benefit is conferred. This does nothing to protect against wrongful convictions um, and instances like the tragic DeMarlo Berry case. To be clear, we recognize that the benefits offered to jailhouse informants must be disclosed to the defense, and the information they provide 
needs to be disclosed so that a testifying informant can be adequately cross-examined. Their attorney and the defendant are entitled to do this under the United States Constitution. But as written, Assembly Bill 201 reaches far beyond what the Constitution requires, far beyond what is necessary to avoid wrongful convictions. It does this by endangering prisoners who dare to speak out about prison violence, even if their testimony is never used and their information is independently verified. Ms. Anderson used the word snitch during her testimony, and she apologized for it. And we've all heard the phrase, snitches get stitches. And sometimes it's used colloquially between folks who have never seen the inside of a jail cell. But there's nothing funny about that phrase to people who are in prison who are faced every day with the prospect of violence against them. This bill requires them to be identified even if their information is independently verified and their testimony is never used. We remain willing to work with the Assemblywoman and stakeholders to craft a bill that is consistent with the constitutional obligations regarding the, tra the tracking and disclosure of benefits afforded incarcerated witnesses, and we thank this committee for its time. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Noble, and certainly would uh, invite future collaboration on parts of the bill that uh, you believe to be problematic. Um, obviously, we're moving through session at a pretty rapid pace, but there's still some time for that. So um, would invite further discussion from uh, you on behalf of the District Attorney's Association on some of those concerns. But thank you for being here this morning, providing testimony. BPS, let's go to the next caller in opposition, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 877 please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 877, press star six to unmute yourself and begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Chairman Yeager and Honorable Members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Ron Dreer. I'm an honorably retired Reno Police Major Crimes Detective. I've lobbied on behalf of our state and local law enforcement peace officers, our families and victims of crimes for many years. Based on the language of AB 201, I am requesting your opposition. This bill appears to codify the discovery process, as you've heard. Brady is about discovery. Discovery should be given to the defense as required. If discovery is not provided, then there's an obvious problem with both the prosecution and the defense side. For the last several years of my career, I was assigned to the Reno Police Major Crimes Unit. Our major crimes function was investigating child abduction murders. Many times, information regarding unsolved cases come forward when incarcerated individuals confess or brag to other inmates their past criminal wrongdoings. When that information is shared, usually in the form of a kite with correctional officers, they in turn notify us, and we then begin the lengthy investigation process, importantly, of cooperating their information to determine whether the information is credible. Oftentimes, this process results in solving old murder cases. The bill in its present form exposes on inmates, bringing that information forward to potential harm and death. And as you heard Ms. Noble say, their identifiers are known as snitches, are, are, are known and they are labeled as snitches. We, we must protect informants from harm. Or they will come forward and offer their, or they will not come forward and offer their assistance. In camera hearings before a judge, such as listed in section six, keeping the informant's identity confidential is necessary. The use of informants in solving crimes such as the ones that I still investigate are crucial to us solving these horrific crimes. To state that the defense attorney will keep the confidential information from the defendant is ludicrous. Perhaps amending the bill by placing criminal and civil sanctions on those defense attorneys who divulge the confidential information to their clients and that release of that information leads to the harm or death of an informant may provide the protection needed. In my opinion, this is an anti-victim bill. In conclusion, the implementation of this bill will lead, in my opinion, to criminals not being held accountable for their acts and for the crimes they have committed. If potential informants know what their know that their identity will be revealed, they will not come forward with vital information so critical to helping victims find closure and to aiding law enforcement solve crimes. On behalf of the professional peace officers of our state, our families, our victims of crime, I'm asking you to oppose this bill in its present form. 
We need to continue to encourage informants to come forward with the important, crucial information they possess. I would appreciate you opposing AB 201, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions should you have them. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Dreer. Appreciate it. BPS, let's go to the next caller in opposition, please. Would the caller with the last three digits of 692 slowly state and then spell your name for the record? You'll have two minutes and you may begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Steve Gramas, S-T-E-V-E-G-R-A-M-M-A-S. I am the president of the Las Vegas Police Protective Association, which represents over 3,500 commissioned officers in the state of Nevada. I'm also a proud member of the Public Safety Alliance of Nevada. I'm calling in opposition of this bill uh, as it could negatively impact several avenues as it relates to informants. This bill will substantially limit the effectiveness that law enforcement can use informants in the prosecution of criminals. It's been made known by Mr. Dreer as well as others that were in opposition that this bill not only discloses the identity of an informant who is a precipient witness to something or having direct info that could testify, but could also make known people that do not have an intention of testifying or would otherwise not normally be made known. I fear in law enforcement this is a slippery slope into working its way into the use of confidential informants out in the regular world for police officers. I myself, who has used confidential informants for approximately nine years of my career in law enforcement, know how valuable of a tool that informant is. I also know how scared the informants themselves are of getting involved with law enforcement, even with the protections currently in place. If we begin to chip away at those, we will start to see good cases. We will start to see heinous criminals never be apprehended, never held accountable, because informants will not want to come forward and participate. There's been talk of the cases that were bad and how prosecutors or potentially officers have mishandled information. Yet nobody has spoken of good cases where that testimony from an in-custody subject gave us the ability to hold a heinous criminal accountable and be prosecuted for the acts that they've committed. I would ask that a lot more thought go into this bill as opposed to just a sweeping passing and would appreciate the involvement if needed from the LVPPA. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Gramis. BPS, could we take the next caller in opposition, please? With the caller with the last three digits of 456, please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and me begin. Good morning, Chairman Yeager and members of the committee. My name is AJ Delap at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. My last name is phonetically spelled David Easy Lincoln Adam Paul. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department is opposed to AB 201. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department would like to echo the opposition testimony provided in AB 201 by Jenny Noble of the Nevada District Attorneys Association. With that, I would like to conclude my short testimony and thank you, Chairman Yeager and members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. DLEP. BPS, let's take the next caller in opposition. We are on opposition to Bill AB201. Press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition to Bill AB201. Thank you so much, BPS, appreciate that. I'll close opposition testimony. At this time, I'll open up neutral testimony. We don't have anyone in neutral on the Zoom. BPS, could we check the phone lines to see if we might have somebody neutral there? I suspect we don't, but perhaps I'm wrong. To provide neutral testimony on Bill AB201, press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, at this time, there are no callers to provide neutral testimony. Thank you, BPS. It didn't seem like a bill that would have any neutral testimony, so at least my instinct is right there. 
Uh, thank you, BPS, for helping us through the phone testimony today. I will close neutral testimony. And at this time, I'll invite our three presenters back to provide any concluding remarks. Um, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to uh, Professor Anderson and then Mr. Erb. So please go ahead, Assemblywoman. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, again, Assemblywoman Gonzalez for the record, District 16. Um, I just wanted to correct some of the information that was shared in testimony. This bill uh, doesn't really change or or um, harm the use of, of incarcerated informants. Rather, it protects both offices, both the district attorney's office and the defendant um, when using or when there is a situation where a jailhouse informant is used. You are still able to use jailhouse informants. You're still able to vet the jailhouse informant. Um, and all those procedures addressed in this bill um, is what the district attorney's office should be already doing and has agreed to do as you've heard in, in this hearing. Um, so I just wanted to address and correct the record on some of those things. And so in closing, um, I would very much like to thank both of my co-presenters um, in helping me present this bill and bring this important legislation forward. Again, it's it's to really just clean up some of the, the um, issues that we have had when it comes to using jailhouse or incarcerated informants. Um, please support AB 201. Um, and I will turn it over to my two presenters for their closing statements. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Professor Anderson, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, this is Jen C. Anderson with the Rocky Mountain Innocence Center. Again, I want to thank you for taking the time to consider this bill and reiterate our support for it. Um, I heard the concerns um, expressed um, by those in opposition, but I wanted to address just a couple of things. First of all, it doesn't affect the police and their ability to use confidential informants. This is simply a tracking system, um, really, for prosecutors and information that prosecutors need to turn over to defense attorneys. Um, it doesn't affect confidential informants unless those confidential informants are currently incarcerated and are talking to the defendant while they are incarcerated. So I, I just want to make clear that it is a narrow bill at this point. Um, it doesn't also doesn't endanger. I mean, we understand that if someone decides to become an informant while they're in jail or prison, and if they end up um, spending longer time, that they may be in danger because of their choice to give information on another case. However, it doesn't endanger them any more than what does now, because as pointed out by the, those in opposition, prosecutors are constitutionally obligated now to give that information to defense attorneys. So all this does is codify that constitutional obligation in statute. And finally, it's really important to me that you understand that this would have made all of the difference in DeMarlo Berry's case. And I think DeMarlo would want you to know that too. When I told DeMarlo that Richard Iden had recanted his testimony, it was the only time I saw DeMarlo get emotional during the entire time I represented him. And he couldn't understand why someone would put an innocent man in prison. And I really can't understand that either. But had the defense had the information about what Demar what Richard Iden was getting in exchange for his testimony, the leniency, the rewards, I think that that would have brought reasonable doubt to his testimony and likely resulted in um, DeMarlo Berry's acquittal. Uh, I think it's important to see that this the, the effect of this is to protect the innocent, to protect the prosecutors, to protect defendants, and to protect the victims. So thank you again so much for your time and ask you to support AB 201. Thank you, Professor Anderson. Mr. Erb will give you the last word on Assembly Bill 201. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Nathaniel Erb here on behalf of the uh, Innocence Project. I wanna thank the committee for all its wonderful questions today, the Assemblywoman for bringing this forward uh, and all the advocates uh, and, uh, and opponents who have, have talked about this uh, over the years with us and other partners. Uh, it's been at least 13 years of discussion around this issue uh, in which uh, the, the bill and the, the key provisions of it have uh, changed and evolved, but are still that core conversation. So we've had many, many years of conversation about this, many more discussions. Uh, you heard from the opponents uh, this morning that in large part, they're not really opponents. They agree about the key provisions and what we're trying to attain. And I don't view them as our opponents either. I think we're all in the same boat. Uh, if there's questions around uh, key word changes, language changes, I'm sure we will continue to have 
uh, uh, time available to talk about that with them. Uh, this bill is a solid bill built off of uh, Alex model, built off of language passed in Texas and Connecticut and uh, uh, Nebraska and Maryland just last year that we worked on. Uh, it, that goes to all these provisions. Uh, we do not see the concerns, but we are happy to entertain them and discuss them. If there's a, a word out of place or a comma that could be put in the, to to tighten it up. But I think the committee has heard today many compelling reasons of why this legislation is needed. Uh, it has heard that these are very rare instances of use, uh, important use, but we need to make sure that uh, our communities aren't harmed by people being wrongfully incarcerated, that our communities aren't harmed by people going free because they were not properly identified, uh, and that our court system works the way that we intend to work. Uh, this is something that I think uh, it should be uh, a low bar for us, uh, and we are excited to work with the committee uh, on this final last step after these uh, over a decade work on this issue and uh, to get it over the finish line. So I thank the chairman and the vice cha chairwoman and the members of the committee for discussing this with us over the years uh, and the many members who's, uh, of the public that spoke today, and we're excited to finally finish this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Erb. And uh, as you know, we do have a little bit of time still. We've got about a month until our first committee passage deadline. So I would certainly invite our presenters today to continue the dialogue uh, with some of those who, who spoke in opposition, because I, I agree, I don't think there's a philosophical opposition to what's trying to be done. I think it's an opposition to particular portions or maybe particular words or phrases. So certainly would invite you to continue those discussions and please keep me updated on how those discussions go. But uh, for now, I just want to thank uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, uh, Professor Anderson, and Mr. Erb for presenting this morning. We appreciate very much you spending a little bit of your Thursday morning with us, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 201. We'll go to our final item on the agenda today, which is public comment. Just by way of reminder, we reserve up to 30 minutes of each meeting for public comment. Public commenters will have two minutes to provide public comment. Public comment is a time for members of the public to provide general information or thoughts about jurisdiction within the Assembly Judiciary Committee. It is not a time to talk about bills that we've already heard or, or relitigate those arguments, but rather a time to bring up matters of a general nature. So with that being said, BPS, could we go to the phones and see if there's anybody who'd like to give public comment this morning? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. With the caller with the last three digits of 556, Please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Anne Marie Grant, A N N E M A R I E G R A N T. My brother was killed during a mental health crisis, hogtied by Reno police for 40 minutes and then asphyxiated to death at Washoe County Jail while still hogtied. I wanted to mention that yesterday was actually uh, the six year anniversary of RTA Porter's killing by Washoe County Sparks and Reno police. And I neglected to mention that the gun RTA had was a BB gun. So uh, today I wanna to talk about Johnny Bonta who was killed 10 17 at 4 a.m. What I wanna talk about is what his family experienced and their treatment from Reno police and Sparks police. Johnny was shot at his home the police then kept Lisa, who was 52 years old and suffering from terminal stage four breast cancer, and her 16-year-old daughter, who was also present, in an ambulance three feet away from where Johnny's body laid, riddled with bullets from the police. For, for, from 4 a.m. until 8 a.m., they were kept in the back of a police ambulance. Lisa was denied her medication. They were placed into the ambulance with Johnny's body laying feet away. Family members were denied access to Lisa, who was without her oxygen and medication and wore only a thin nightgown. 
They sat feet from his body, and they were denied use of the bathroom and were not allowed to leave the ambulance. After four hours, they were then brought to Sparks Police Department to be interrogated for hours, never being told they could leave and that they did not have to participate in this interrogation. These families were in shock and grief, and they're dragged down to the department after their loved one was killed right in front of them. The entire time, her older daughter, Jill, was at the apartment trying to obtain Lisa's medication and oxygen, and Reno police refused that um, to give her Lisa's meds, and they refused. Um, and the fam- Lisa did file a lawsuit against the agencies, and uh, she did settle with them. But sadly, as I mentioned before, she never found out who the officers were who killed her husband. She died from her uh, breast cancer months before D.A. Chris Hicks ever released his report nearly two years later. Please support bills that promote transparency and accountability and provide further protection for community members, not police. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, Ms. Grant. VPS, are there other individuals wishing to give public comment this morning? Yes, Chair. With the caller with the last three digits of 419, Please slowly state and then spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Thank you, Chair Yeager, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Benjamin Chalino. That's B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N-C-H-A-L-L-I-N-O-R. I am the Policy Director for Faith in Action Nevada. We are also a member of the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance. On March 31st, 20 days from today, both the state and federal eviction moratoria are set to expire. According to the last numbers that have been reported, there are estimated up to 500,000 Nevadans that are at risk of facing eviction. The Gwynn Center also reports that the majority of these who are experiencing unemployment and difficulty in paying rent due to COVID-19 is, are disproportionately BIPOC communities. Unless the moratoria are extended here in Nevada, we will be facing another crisis on our hands. We should be asking what can be done to help these Nevadans who are falling through the cracks and being left behind. Due to the extremely large number of pending unemployment and rental assistance claims, families are not able to receive the public assistance that the state has promised tenants in time to stave off evictions. There are two bills that can be uh, that the committee can take action on, um, AB 141 and AB 161. These bills will provide much relief to those who are already suffering due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we hope that the committee acts. Just to make a final note, Nevada. Nevada should be focusing on keeping families in their homes now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, Mr. Chalinor. VPS, is there anybody else who'd like to give public comment? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers wishing to make public comment. Thank you, BPS, and thank you again for your help in running this meeting this morning. I will close public comment before we talk about where we go from here. Anything else from our members this morning? Don't see anything else. Uh, So while we were meeting, our agenda was posted for tomorrow, and uh, we will be starting at 8 o'clock, so I'm sorry about that. I know it's early, but we have three three bills we're going to hear tomorrow, and we also have a work session, so there are Oh, it looks like about seven bills on work session. So uh, at some point today, members, you'll be getting a work session document that details uh, what the work session will look like. But I would encourage you to refresh your memory on those bills, some of which we heard really only a couple weeks ago, but uh, days here can sometimes seem like months. So please go back and refresh your memory on those bills. And uh, would certainly appreciate if anyone could let me know if they uh, have issues with any of the bills um, that are on work session tomorrow. It's just always helpful to know for planning the meeting tomorrow morning. Um, Beyond that, I don't have uh, agendas out yet for next week. Still don't know what Monday uh, might look like. So stay tuned. I'll let you know tomorrow um, whether we're going to have a meeting Monday and if we do, what time it's going to be. And then also want to remind everyone, uh, if you didn't remember, that it's daylight savings time this coming weekend. So we're going to unfortunately lose an hour of our weekend. And I'll remind you that tomorrow. So uh, with all that behind us, again, I want to thank the committee for your hard work and your questions today. I think that bill hearing uh, did justice to the concept that we were discussing today. 
and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. We'll see you here tomorrow morning in this committee at 8 a.m. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Hi, thank you, Chair.